kind of loud. There we go. Okay, so make sure everybody is welcomed in. Okay, so it is now 6 p.m. So welcome in everybody. Welcome in uh, Village Garden Club members. Uh, this, uh, my name is Allison Henline and I'm the Education and Outreach Director at the Shaker Historical Society located in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Tonight I am joined by Dr. Nancy Unger, who is a professor of history at Santa Clara University in California. She's joining us live tonight through, uh, oops, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Um, uh, Sally, would you be able to mute yourself, please? There we go. I just muted it. No worries. <laughs> Um, but we're joined live by Dr. Nancy Unger, who's going to be speaking to us uh, with her talk titled Changing the World, Empowering Themselves, Women's Club in Environmental History. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it on over to uh, Dr. Unger. Well, thank you for that nice introduction. I'm going to uh, share my screen. Okay, so uh, so here we go. Uh, many thanks to Allison Henline for arranging this talk and all of you for, uh, for viewing it um, and for all the good work of the Shaker Historical Society. Congratulations on the uh, grant that, um, that you received uh, to start an oral history project. Uh, the Village Garden Club sounds like the ideal initial subject. Historians like myself are thrilled that you're gonna take on this important work. So what I'd like to do first is to provide some context for that club so that you can see where it fits into a much larger story. And then I'd like to talk just a little bit about how oral histories specifically have helped to shape my own work um, in contributing to that story. By 1910, oh, wait a minute here, just a sec. By 1910, there were hundreds of women's conservation clubs in the United States with a combined national membership, according to activist Lydia Adams Williams, of one million. Adams Williams represented the views of many of these club women when she proclaimed, quote, man has been too busy building railroads, constructing ships, engineering great projects and exploiting vast commercial enterprises to take the time necessary to consider the problems which concern the welfare of the home and the future. Her contemporary, George Knapp, represented the prevailing male view when he called assertions like hers unadulterated humbug. And he dismissed conservationist dire prophecies as baseless vaporings. According to Knapp, men should be praised, not criticized, for turning forests into villages, mines into ships and skyscrapers, scenery into work. Pioneering educator and psychologist G. Stanley Hall claimed that club women like Adams Williams suffered from effeminization because, he said, caring for nature is female sentiment, not sound science. Even some men were criticized for promoting wilderness preservation. John Muir was a prime target, seen here elaborately clothed in a dress, apron, and flowered bonnet, fussily and fruitlessly attempting to sweep back the waters flooding Hetch Hetchy Valley. By 1910, Muir's crusade to preserve the glories of the valley in its natural state was supported by 150 women's clubs nationwide. San Francisco city engineer Marsden Manson spoke for many when he described Hetch Hetchy's defenders in the thinly veiled homophobic terms as short haired women and long haired men. I don't believe that women are inherently more protective of the environment than men are. So I set out to investigate why and how such gender divides developed and to what impact. The result is this book, Beyond Nature's Housekeepers, American Women in Environmental History. Women 
repeatedly told that they were more moral, sentimental, and altruistic than men, were also deemed the natural teachers of children. As such, they began formally claiming their environmental authority. In 1829, botanist Elmira Phelps wrote that the study of botany seems peculiarly adapted to females. And she counseled that mothers and female teachers must become deeply familiar with specific aspects of the environment if they wanted to inspire an understanding of nature in their children and students. Women were particularly drawn to nature writing. Susan Fenimore Cooper's seasonal journal, Rural Hours, published in 1850, helped to popularize the nature essay. She urged her readers to think of their land as really one room in the greater household of earth, which was the common home of all. Women, she believed, bore a special responsibility for the preservation and conservation of natural resources from the avarice of men. Their protection of nature would benefit themselves as well as future generations. If they shirked their responsibility, however, not only would natural resources be squandered, but women would also forfeit their moral authority. Her widely read work piqued many women's interest in nature study and in the protection of plants and animals. It was women's job to civilize the wilderness serving as nature's housekeepers. So this is a close-up of this, of this picture. Here at a lumber camp in 1896, we see women posing with the civilizing tools of their gender. A woman is pouring coffee from a silver pot into a china cup, and there are a couple of brooms. In more densely settled areas, women began organizing into gardening clubs and other organizations dedicated to environmental information and protection. Even clubs not exclusively devoted to environmental topics often had a dedicated committee or branch. The National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, for example, organized in 1896, stressed the importance of outdoor education and campaigned for the right for inner city African-American children to have access to nature. Now, despite ongoing assertions of their sentimentality, women's approach to non-human nature urged them grudging respect, if not outright admiration. According to Clara Burdett, the first president of the California Federation of Women's Clubs, established in 1900, a lot of money-making wood sawers would have split up our giant sequoias, pride of the world, into toothpicks and lead pencils if we women hadn't caught them at it and raised such a shriek that the men couldn't help hearing. Ever so many things like these we are doing, and the best of it all is we've got the men interested by letting them believe they thought of it first and are doing it all, and we are getting ever so much help and good work out of them just by letting them hold the lines and shout at the team while we drive. Seriously speaking, we believe that organized womanhood has so impressed itself on the Commonwealth that good men court our helpfulness and active strength in all reforms that make for higher moral standards and the protection of the home, and that bad men fear the power of an organized force that demands, through public opinion, pure homes, clean life, clean politics, and pure religion the only sure basis for continued prosperity. Some women like Ada Howie urged men's grudging respect for female environmental authority by proving that women's sentimental moral approach could also be profitable. In 1887, the middle-aged Howie, a member of Milwaukee's social elite, inherited her family's dairy farm, Sunny Peak. She saw being a woman as an important asset to farm life and took great pains to present her achievements as a dairy farmer as the result of conventional notions of femininity and women's work. She believed that her success came 
because of the fact that she was a woman, not in spite of it. The secret to Howie's success was her conviction that a dairy barn, quote, should be as clean as a champion kitchen. 30 years before legislation required the sanitary production of milk, Howie's feminine dairy wisdom demanded that the interior of, interior of the barn and other outbuildings at Sunny Peak be whitewashed, then scrubbed once a week with soap suds and boiling water. The barn's windows were not only regularly cleaned, but outfitted with curtains. Though she eschewed lace, her installation of curtains in a cow barn might still be dismissed by many as silly. But as with all of Howie's innovations, there was practicality behind the seemingly frivolous. After the stalls had been well aired in summer and purified by the sun's rays, the curtains could be used to keep out flies. Cows were not tied to upright posts, but separated by hinged partitions that allowed each animal comfortable standing room and ample space for lying down. To lower the possibility of spreading disease, milkers were required to wash their hands before milking each cow. Howie's cattle were brushed and petted and everything done to make the barn as sanitary and attractive as possible. She made no effort to hide her emotional attachment to her cattle. I love the cows on my farm as one would love a person. And I do not believe the people generally have an appreciation of the worthy and noble animals commensurate with their true worth. Howie's pampered cows were considerably lampooned as in this cartoon in which one cow being fanned while lounging on a feather bed looks on happily as another enjoys a shower. In the caption, Heather Bell is asking, will you kindly press the button for the milkmaid rose? I'm quite ready to be milked now. But more than sentiment ruled Howie's actions on Sunny Peak Farm. Her contention that cattle tenderly cared for would produce higher and better yields was borne out when many of her prize cows regularly set production records. In 1902, when most cows might produce as much as three pounds of butter a week, some of the independently tested cows in Howie's herd were producing five times that amount. Howie's application of the domestic sphere's standards of cleanliness and comfort to the farm environment was ultimately so successful that her innovations became widely studied. In her words, in that period, my methods were considered so unusual that a number of prominent publishers thought the sanitary barn, tenderly cared for cattle, and other innovations might be worthy of general interest. The consequence was that Sunny Peak, the gentle cattle and its happy owner were given worldwide range of publicity. This adorable photograph of Howie playing the mandolin to her cows so captured the public's imagination that a painting was made from this image and it was reproduced in all the leading magazines and papers in England and the United States. As with many of her unconventional practices, results trumped or at least blunted ready scorn. Howie's fame spread. She spoke on dairying and homemaking to agricultural experts across the country as well as in Canada. She traveled to Europe in 1906 to give a talk in Paris on poultry. The British king, Edward VII, granted her a special permit to visit his dairy barns. The Japanese government sent a delegate to Wisconsin to purchase cows from Howie's herd to improve its nation's dairy stock. Following her death in 1936, her humane and sanitary feminine approach to dairying, one requiring no expensive tools or equipment, continued to be so widely adopted that it markedly transformed the farm environment. She was a pioneer whose winning combination of science and emotion produced cleaner, healthier, and better farms and farm products. Now, Many women's environmental knowledge and activism of the period remains much less well known. Of all the groups that I've studied, the Cambridge Plant and Garden Club 
sounds the most like your uh, village garden club. In 1889, a group of elite women uh, decided to spend some of their time in improving their minds by the study of botany. One of the group's original goals was that each member would show at least one plant she had cultivated over the year. But when the serious educational atmosphere caused the group to lose members, it added a social half hour during which women enjoyed refreshments, awarded prizes, and exchanged seats. The founding members spoke of the moral influence of flowers, traded recipes for fertilizers, and invited speakers from neighboring Harvard University. Professor George Lincoln Goodale introduced the group to ecology, a word so new it was not yet in the dictionary, and suggested several related courses of study. Slowly, the club's members began to think more deeply about the natural world around them and their own place in it first in rather theoretical terms, but increasingly in more personal and practical ways. For example, in 1902, members heard a lecture on herbs for the service of man and plants as food and ornament, as well as those for medicine. One member expressed her belief that in the vegetative kingdom, there are antidotes for all diseases, if only we know them. And in 1914, a member noted that trees cut down by settlers had not been replaced and recommends that it is time to begin to do so. Three years later, a guest speaker educated the Cambridge Plant and Garden Club about food shortages induced by the war then raging in Europe, urging members to avoid waste and to preserve food in their homes through canning and other measures. Once their own country entered what became the First World War, the club, like the nation at large, dedicated itself to food conservation. Food will win the war, was the popular refrain of the federal government's food administration, led by future President Herbert Hoover. Each Cambridge Plant and Garden Club member was asked to be a committee of one in this way to win the war. We must stand guard until the next crop in order to feed both the armies abroad and ourselves at home. And it reveals something of the club member's social class that the speaker added, we should see to it that our maids work with us. The Cambridge Plant and Garden Club was not as political or engaged as many women's clubs during the Gilded Age and Progressive Era at the turn of the 20th century, but it was representative of the ways in which early 20th century women's interests in growing decorative plants, especially flowers, to beautify their homes gradually led them to a greater appreciation of nature, just as it had an earlier generation of pioneer women. It also imbued in women a special sense that they had a unique ability and responsibility to conserve and protect the natural world. Cleaning up urban environments was not enough. They saw themselves as the housekeepers of non-human nature as well. When the Cambridge Plant and Garden Club's membership remained modest um, in its conservation activities, I'll, while it did that, other women and women's groups were decidedly more vocal and aggressive. And as time went on, their activism took many different forms. May 25th, 1937, marked the premiere of the We Say What We Think Club a monthly radio program out of Madison, Wisconsin, produced exclusively for women. It featured five Wisconsin homemakers determined to speak their minds. The program premiered in the Great Depression, continued through World War II, finally stopping in 1957, a total of 20 years. Listeners as unofficial club members were invited to mail in their comments and suggestions so that they could say what they thought. The rural leaders of the We Say What We Think Club viewed the prescribed gender spheres as both sensible and natural, noting on air, in the division of labor between man and woman, it has been woman's function to feed, to prepare food, and to do the other things necessary for the maintenance of the family unit. Rejecting the stereotype of farm women as worn out drudges who envied urban women's lives of convenience and sophistication, 
they firmly established the superior features of their rural lives, claiming their rightful place as actors in the national scene, not wishful onlookers. Club members agreed that the girl who marries a farmer will know and love nature, will know the joy of labor and tasks well done, and will live a full, well-rounded life. While they acknowledged that no lifestyle guaranteed happiness, they were confident that rural women had many advantages over their sisters of the same socioeconomic class in the city, a superiority wrought by environmental differences. With running water, electricity, and other conveniences all available on Wisconsin farms, the farm wife, they said, has more opportunities to enjoy life in her work than the city wife, who has to coop herself up in some small, hot, stuffy apartment in a large city. The club's broadcasts in 1943 on soil conservation were fostered by the perception of rural women as especially tuned to nature, morality, and spirituality. Astonished that in less than 100 years of farming, they said, between 25% and 70% of the original topsoil the good Lord gave us is gone. Club leader Isabel Bauman detailed how traditional farming methods had led to such devastating erosion. We Americans, club member Selma Sorison put it succinctly, haven't used soil wisely. Sorensen emphasized that erosion was the result of modern farming techniques. The women warned that if calls for erosion prevention were not heeded because of men's relentless quest for immediate profit, lesser crop yields would lower the standard of living for future farming families. Club leaders took the long view, asserting that every farm woman was obligated to know about the dangers of soil erosion, as well as the strategies to combat it for the sake, they said, of our children and our children's children on the farm. Accordingly, the club leaders offered their listeners a variety of remedies for soil erosion. They described and advocated for each remedy in considerable detail. Man must work with nature, they concluded, not against her. For 20 years, the We Say What We Think Club encouraged rural women to take themselves seriously especially in their role as a moralizing influence. They urged their listeners to recognize that environmental problems concerned not just the men in the fields, but also their wives and daughters in the home. Women who, by virtue of their gender, had a unique and important role to play in resource conservation and preservation. Because the cast said what they thought, Rural women were encouraged to see themselves not as support staff for their husbands and children, but as independent and valuable individuals taking their rightful place as reformers in the larger world. Three years before the We Say What We Think Club gave its final broadcast, a rapidly growing urban and suburban population suffered increasingly from pollution. In October 1954, dense smog shut down Los Angeles schools and industry. Local homemakers called for women's groups to take direct action. They criticized elected officials and businessmen for their reluctance to implement costly smoke conversion measures. In one of the first of many well-publicized all-women protests against pollution, several dozen homemakers from Pasadena staged a march. Calling themselves the Smogateers, the women wore gas masks and carried banners criticizing the government's inaction. Theirs was a gendered appeal and they highlighted their traditional nature's housekeeper's role. One woman, for example, holds a broom in addition to a sign reading, we want a clean sweep of smog. They emphasized their maternal concerns as well. The youngest marcher, three-year-old Agatha Acker, wore a gas mask, as did the doll that she carried. Winds finally dispersed the heavy smog, but local women working individually and in groups, including the Pasadena Council for Women's Clubs and the Los Angeles Council of Women for Legislative Action, continued to marshal their forces to combat air pollution, to ensure the welfare of the people of greater Los Angeles, 
rather than sacrifice it on the altar of corporate profit. Women's organizations particularly active in promoting environmental awareness and protection in the second half of the 20th century included the League of Women Voters, the American Association of University Women, the Federation of Women's Clubs, and the Garden Club of America. Women contributed significantly to the nascent anti-nuclear movement. In St. Louis, a group of women, Eves Against Adams, provided the foundation for the Citizens Committee for Nuclear Information. Member Dr. Alfred Schwartz proposed that children's baby teeth formed from 1948 to 1953, the first years of the uh, fallout era, be collected and tested to form a baseline for levels of radioactivity. The project, directed by internist Louise Rees, sought 50,000 baby teeth and attracted instantaneous and worldwide attention. Its emphasis on babies and milk raised the concerns and involvement of mothers everywhere, placing them at the center of this high stake scientific controversy and the movement to stop nuclear testing. Dire predictions concerning babies, children, and future generations made nuclear testing increasingly a woman's issue. The rapidly expanding military industrial complex intensified their fears as huge government contracts were awarded to businesses to develop new defense technologies and weapons, both chemical and conventional. On October 30th, 1961, as part of the escalating weapons race, the Soviet Union tested the largest nuclear weapon ever. Two days later, some 50,000 primarily white middle-class American women abandoned their homemaker duties to march and demonstrate in major cities and suburban communities. In this Women's Strike for Peace, founded by Congresswoman Bella Abzug and activist Dagmar Wilson, Protesters demanded that the world end the arms race, not the human race. According to Wilson, in the face of male logic, which seems to us utterly illogical, it was time for women to speak out. Women Strike for Peace activist Blanche Posner put the strike in starkly maternal terms. When mothers are putting their children's breakfast on the table, they see not only Wheaties and milk, but they also see uh, strontium-90 and iodine-131 released by the nuclear blast. They feared for the health and life of their children. An organization of the same name grew out of the original strike and continued anti-nuclear protest. The Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962 made the potential for nuclear disaster impossible to dismiss as female hysteria. School children practiced nuclear attack drills and panicked suburbanites dug bomb shelters in their backyards. Women's Strike for Peace held demonstrations throughout the crisis, wielding signs promoting peace and urging President John Kennedy to be careful as they emphasized that their maternal concerns about children and the future trumped any and all political issues. Kennedy claimed that the women's generational arguments influenced his thinking, culminating in the US-Soviet treaty to ban all but underground testing of nuclear devices. Quote, I have said that control of arms is a mission that we undertake for our children and our grandchildren, and that they have no lobby in Washington. No one is better qualified to represent their interests than the mothers and grandmothers of America. Although Women's Strike for Peace members were denounced as annoying lapel pullers by some members of Congress, their persistent outspokenness also generated votes for the treaty as politicians attempted to avoid fallout from mothers. As the 1960s progressed, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique and Rachel Carson's Silent Spring revealed the costs of the degradation of both the environment and women, leading to a variety of movements in which issues of women's rights and empowerment overlapped with those of environmental protection. Across the nation, countless homemakers who identified primarily as wives and mothers 
dedicated to the service of others, join students in seeking alternatives to common and untenable practices affecting the environment. Issues and activities emerging from perceptions of gender, race, and class combine to transform American ideas about women's proper roles and influence attitudes and actions that would ultimately help shape the future of the planet. In the autumn of 1971, Nan Cheney and 15 other Wisconsin homemakers began Women for a Peaceful Christmas, a unique attempt to do nothing less than remake American culture. Under the slogan, no more shopping days till peace, Women for a Peaceful Christmas organized ostensibly powerless homemakers into a quiet revolt against what they called an economy which thrives on war and the destruction of our Earth's resources. Women for a Peaceful Christmas urged the public, especially women, the sex that did the vast bulk of holiday shopping, to take economic, political, and environmental matters into their own hands. If you don't want your Christmas celebrations to be controlled by the monoliths that corrupt governments and pollute environments, don't buy the prepackaged disposable Christmas. Make your own. Rather to the surprise of the group's founders, Women for a Peaceful Christmas was immediately inundated with queries and requests for informational materials. In five months time, the movement had spread to almost every state with members ranging in age from teenagers to grandmothers. Women for a Peaceful Christmas received national press coverage. Members of the organization wanted more than just an end to the war in Vietnam. They sought a reordering of national and personal priorities, beginning with a turning away from the waste and conspicuous consumption that had come to characterize Christmas and Hanukkah celebrations. They complained that the tinsel and trappings that appeared earlier each year clouded the clear and simple meaning of true Christmas. They lamented the fact that Christmas has, quote, become a time of tremendous waste of resources with mountains of wrapping and patch packaging material thrown away and tremendous pressure to buy badly made toys. Commercialism had distorted the message of peace, love, and joy and persuaded consumers that peace is the product of exploitation, that love is measured by material possessions, and that joy abounds in compulsive consumption. What we are really aiming for, explained Nan Cheney, is a change in attitudes. We're trying to raise people's consciousness about the wartime economy and what they can do to control their own consumption of resources. Women for a Peaceful Christmas offered suggestions to make celebrations more meaningful, less commercial, less wasteful, more peaceful, emphasizing activities that encouraged personal involvement on the part of those bestowing gifts to give more of themselves than of their bank accounts. Rather than passively consuming manufactured goods, Women for a Peaceful Christmas urged others to greet your distant friends with your own wish, written your own way. Decorate your tree with fruits, cookies, and handmade trinkets. Gift your loved ones with a song or poem or something personal or handmade. The rewards they promised will be many. Not only will you save money and conserve energy, you'll also discover your creative personality. But more importantly, you'll find a way to say what has become so difficult for us to say, I love you. Now, as the war in Vietnam drew to a close, the focus of Women for a Peaceful Christmas shifted increasingly to environmental issues. Mindful of worldwide food and energy shortages and of pollution and economic uncertainty, its members campaigned especially against waste, including the purchase by the middle class of unnecessary clothing, non-biodegradable -bio plastics, and the use of energy inefficient appliances. When asked during the group's fourth year of operation if its goal was to undermine the American way of life, Nan Cheney responded, I hope so. We have to rethink the way we live. 
I can't believe we're so dependent on useless manufactured things that we can't learn to make useful things instead of buying what Madison Avenue tells us we want. Additional aspects of the crusade launched by Women for a Peaceful Christmas have been carried into the new millennium. Many feminists urge women to recognize and resist the oppression brought on by media insistence that women find power, joy, and fulfillment while bonding with each other in an endless round of spending sprees on non-essential, environmentally damaging goods. Adbusters Media Foundation annually organizes International Buy Nothing Day, a series of events and boycotts in 65 nations worldwide at the beginning of the major shopping season. This campaign, like that of its predecessor, offers a variety of alternatives to rampant materialism, promoting a shopping frenzy-free holiday season. It urges consideration of the major ecological and economical repercussions of consumption that is most fevered during the winter holiday season, including the perpetuation of sweatshop labor and waste of natural resources around the globe. The effort to highlight how women's spending contributed to the waste of natural resources was taken up by others. The movements raised the national consciousness of the role that everyday Americans could play, for better or for worse, in the deepening environmental crisis. Another group of homemakers formed League Against Nuclear Danger, or LAND, in opposition to a proposed nuclear power plant in Rudolph, Wisconsin. On December 1st, 1973, they staged a highly publicized release of red balloons tagged with postcards describing the various radioactive substances they represented. The balloons finders returned the postcards to Wisconsin from as far away as West Virginia, vividly demonstrating the traveling range of airborne contaminants. The League had been formed earlier in the year by Gertrude Dixon, ridiculed for their lack of scientific credentials. Land members were dismissed by utility officials as illogical, emotional housewives. Unfazed, Dixon requested and carefully studied materials from the Atomic Energy Commission. She urged other activists to approach sophisticated materials with confidence. Don't be dismayed by the jargon and the volume of paper. I cannot stress enough the necessity for us to constantly educate and re-educate ourselves. Only through the torturous route of constant reading, searching, and thinking will we and the public learn. In 1980, the Wisconsin Public Service Commission bowed to widespread opposition, much of it generated by land, and canceled plans that had grown to include eight proposed nuclear power plants. By the time land formally disbanded in 1988, the world had witnessed events that proved the group's concerns were not just emotional vaporings. Environmental justice activists emphasized the disproportionate environmental degradation suffered by poor communities of color. In 1974, Native American women, including Lorelei de Coramines and Madonna Thunderhawk, created Women of All Red Nations, or WARN. True to their organization's name, they joined together with some 300 women from 30 different tribal communities. WARN highlighted the interconnectedness of the problems plaguing their people. These included environmental devastation, uh, primarily due to uranium mining and fossil fuel extraction, political powerlessness, forced sterilizations, poverty, and a broad range of health problems, including higher than average rates of cancer, miscarriage, uh, childbirth, and childhood deaths, stillbirths and childhood deaths. Warren insisted that Indian public health crisis could not be properly understood exclusively within the context of exploitation and pollution of their people's physical environment, but required as well understanding of the larger context of Indian health issues involving out of past and present cultural and political changes. Warren stressed the current generation's responsibility. 
We must preserve our rights for the next generation to live the way we want to, sovereign. Activists urge Native American women to control your own reproduction. Not only control the reproduction of yourselves, but control the reproduction of your own food supplies, your own food systems, to rebuild traditional Native cultures, religions, and ways of living with the earth. Well, there are hundreds more women's organizations and thousands more stories, but I wanna conclude this overview by bringing you up to date on the Cambridge Plant and Garden Club because of its many commonalities um, with the Village Garden Club. Its first conservation project uh, was helping in the cleanup and restoration after the, great, after the great hurricane of 1938. It participated in many outreach projects and to facilitate children's gardening, but continued to be occupied primarily with plant life in their own homes and gardens and with planting trees and flowers in their local community. In the 1960s, it reclaimed a site previously used for dumping and replanted it and continued to focus on restoring other green spaces in the city. However, as late as 1972, it was noted in the official minutes that while the club's achievements in knowledge of horticulture and civil responsibilities were of greatest importance, oh, we do enjoy all those exquisite and delicious teas. Now, here's an example of the way women's garden clubs had been frequently lampooned as earnest yet silly and self-grandizing. The club president in this New Yorker cartoon by Helen Hokanson is breathlessly announcing, in regard to our favorite bird poll, some of you will be thrilled to learn that the chickadee is leading by 75 votes. As the 1970s progressed, middle-class women across the nation were refusing to allow lingering gender-based stereotypes of their political passivity to prevent them from achieving environmental reforms, especially at the local level. Women dominated the leadership and ranks of a variety of community efforts designed to protect the environment. The threat of nuclear destruction was so pervasive that even members of the traditionally apolitical Cambridge Plant and Garden Club found that larger issues of resource conservation increasingly crept into their discussions and lecture topics. They too felt compelled to action. The club's growing concern with environmental damage was evidenced by its emphasis on rejecting highly toxic household cleaners and pesticides in favor of returning to old fashioned herbal preparations and other environmentally benign alternatives. Instead of using commercial toxic sprays to kill ants, for example, members were urged to use cinnamon, cream of tartar, red chili powder, sage, or that old gift perfume you don't like while an oven could be cleaned with salt, baking soda, water, and elbow grease. Global concerns and issues ultimately disrupted the focus on local gardening that had dominated the club for nearly a century. This new club focus, noted one member, contrasted with Helen Hokanson's frivolous garden club woman who spent her time poking and meddling, beautifying, tricking and decking things out we have emerged to do many, many important things. Noted one other member, I came to look upon dear old earth and Cambridge in particular as besieged, crying for rescue. Enjoying the beauty of plants and gardens was no longer enough for me. According to the club's executive committee in 1983, it was time for their distinguished and honored institution to take a public stance against the greatest environmental threat the world has ever faced, the possibility of nuclear war. From 1981 through 1986, the club produced Conservation News in Action, sending this monthly newsletter to garden clubs throughout New England and the Midwest. Openly political, the newsletter described problems including acid rain, pollution, population growth, the growing energy crisis, and most of all, the nuclear threat. Not only the possibility of atomic war, but the problem of nuclear waste already generated. Conservation News in Action also provided detailed advice on the content of letters that members were encouraged to send to Congress to influence governmental actions and policies. 
not all club members were pleased with this new political global focus and activist stance. Republican members bristled at the newsletter's negative depictions of the Reagan administration, especially its buildup of nuclear weapons, and urged that the club refrain from political discussions or activities that were not directly related to its primary focus on plants and gardens. More activist members insisted that the nuclear focus and political activities were wholly suitable for the club. The environmental consequences of nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and nuclear waste are all bad for the garden. In 1983, seven members traveled to the World After Nuclear War Conference in Washington, DC, where they heard leading activists and scientists, including Paul Ehrlich, Carl Sagan, and George Woodwell, discuss from a global perspective the environmental consequences of nuclear weapons. Upon their return, Believing that individuals can make a difference, members of the group crafted a talk, which they presented to various gardening organizations. The talk's title, Non-Trivial non Pursuits, Working to Prevent Nuclear War, made it clear that the exquisite and delicious teas were no longer preoccupying the membership. Following the Chernobyl disaster in 1896, the talk was revised and given a title whose play on words indicated the club's new emphasis on global political concerns rather than personal and local ones. It was Waste Watchers International, working out ways to protect the environment. I understand that the Village Garden Club that this group proposes to study has been active in Shaker Heights since 1930 and was, among other things, instrumental in stopping the uh, Clark Freeway from being built through the city and parklands in the 1960s. So I hope this little overview I've provided helps to provide some context for that group and the evolution of its activities. We're, we're almost done, but um, I just wanted to note that my work depends, oh, and if you have any uh, questions, I hope you'll put them in the, in the chat or feel free to ask at the end. Um, my work depends on the historical record, minutes, reports, clippings, all the things that make up archival holdings. I want to emphasize how crucial I have found oral histories to be. One key example, uh, funded by grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, is the Voices of Women Homemakers collection, the result of historians and volunteers who gathered over 200 oral histories of rural women from 37 states. And they typed it all up and it fit into one archival box. When I was writing about the importance of women's conservation of resources during the Great Depression, I found gems like these. When her family was forced to go on welfare, Violet Cottrell, a Puyallup, Washington homemaker, was proud that her thrift contributed to their survival. Quote, underwear was made from flour sacks. Gardens became very prevalent and very important in our life to get nutrition. I canned and preserved up, up to a thousand quarts of food every year so that my children, my first thing, had good nutritious food. I've always felt good about that because I did do these things. Dorothy Tolley recalled that on their farm in Springdale, Arkansas, her mother, quote, just used everything and saved everything. There was not a scrap of material that wasn't used. Food was stretched to the very limit. She could do more with a chicken than anybody I've ever seen. Even so, the Tolly family's diet, she said, during certain periods of the Depression, consisted almost exclusively of pancakes and navy beans. Mary Raymond of Wyoming, a child of the Depression, remembers craving candy made with sugar, a luxury her family could not afford. The family kept both dairy cows and bees, however, so her mother made candy out of honey and sour cream to sate her daughter's sweet tooth. A feat of resourcefulness Raymond recalled with admiration and gratitude some 50 years later. So, I mean, this is the stuff that is the, you know, the gold of history, and it only exists because people like you take the time to mine for it. Believe me, historians are going to be very grateful for your efforts. History matters. How we understand the past, its gender relations, the way non-human resources are used or abused, 
the actions of various organizations all help us to shape the future. So thank you in advance for your work and for your attention today. I'm happy to take any uh, comments or questions. And I also just want to note, I put my um, uh, email address in this final slide if you wanted to send me a note. Thank you so much, Dr. Unger. That was such an incredible presentation. And thank you so much for you know, taking the time out to share your time and expertise with us at the Shaker Historical Society and for the Village Garden Club. We, we greatly appreciate your work and all that you do as a historian and as an educator. So thank you again for uh, making time for us today on, on what I'm assuming is a very busy Wednesday for everybody today. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank everybody for coming tonight. I see a couple of members from the Village Garden Club, as well as our oral history intern, uh, Caitlin, who has just complimented the presentation. Um, but I wanted to open up the floor to anybody who has any questions or any comments um, for Dr. Unger. Uh, we're going to give it a couple of minutes here before you know we, we start saying our goodbyes. But just from a personal standpoint, I too want to uh, kind of echo Dr. Unger's um, sentiments about oral histories. They're often overlooked in a lot of uh, historical contexts. Um, it's only been recently within, you know, maybe the last uh, 30 or 40 years that they really started to take hold and become a quintessential part of the unwritten record. Um, to be honest with you, a lot of people see them as just as good as the written record, if not better, because it's a lot of things that wouldn't be written down otherwise. So I want to uh, echo that these oral histories that we're doing with the Village Garden Club and with the members of the Village Garden Club, you being so candid and trusting us to record that story and to transcribe it and make it available for the public means the most, uh, not only to us historians like uh, Dr. Unger has mentioned, but to the future generations that may uh, hear that story and reflect on it. Um, but with that being said, I wanted to, again, if anybody has any questions at all or any comments, please feel free to put them in the chat. But I just wanted to thank again, Dr. Unger for this beautiful presentation, genuinely, it made me think, and it was a very, very good, well done presentation. And I thank you for your research and your expertise with this. Well, I, I appreciate that. As you could tell, I get pretty excited about this material, and I have to say, I just love the visuals. I, I really think that that you know that that, that it helps uh, that it helps a lot to have, especially in these times of Zoom. Um, something to look at besides the uh, besides just the just the squares. But uh, I think what you uh, said, Allison, about um, the oral histories is is so true. And I have in in uh, I've written four books now, and um, uh, only one of them didn't use them. And there's just there's just some amazing things in there that you're not going to get any other way. And particularly from people who you know may not be in the historical record in any other way, but are so um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, they're just vital. Oh, we have we have a comment, Laura. We we do uh, from Sally Cantor. Hi, Sally. By the way, um, in light of the mood move towards inclusiveness, how are women's groups affected by the admissions of men? I don't know if you want to answer that, or if you know anything about that, or yeah, I, it's been interesting to me. When my first book first came out, I did a lot of talks, and and um, I, I got a lot of um, pushback from some women's environmental groups who said, you know, what do you mean women are not naturally more um, environmentally conscious than men? I mean, they, they really felt that this was one of their credentials. And, and I said, well, you know, I don't believe that, but here's where I think those ideas came from. So we'd have some back and forth on this. But one of the things that seemed important to me is that, you know, if there is this claim that, well, you know, women are the true environmentalists, what does this do for, does it, does it let men off the hook or does it discourage men from, you know, from wanting to, you know, to, to work together? So, um, you know, I'm all for, you know, women's groups, for men's groups, for, you know, groups of both, uh, of, of, of both sexes. But I mean, I, I think, I think if, if only one sex is claiming environmental authority, we're in, we're in big trouble. So, so I believe that, um, that, that um, I, I'm not against single sex um, organizations, but, but I think that anybody proclaiming that they have, you know, the, the monopoly on this is, is a mistake. Uh, uh, but, um, but it's been, it's been, it's been interesting. Um, oh, just over, you know, the past uh, 20 years or so to see how, how this continues to shift. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's it's certainly worth, like you said, mentioning that um, with inclusivity, especially with diversity now, so not just, you know, 
um, one sex or the other, but maybe people that don't identify as either. Um, have you come across anything like that? Just to kind of build on uh, Sally's point, uh, what is it like for inclusiveness in the historical context of, you know, even beyond uh, sex and gender? Have you noticed well, anything I, like that? Yeah, I think that there's, um, I mean, once you start looking there, there I mean, I, I, I was the keynote at a, a gay and lesbian environmental conference and uh, gave a whole presentation on um, what I have argued is there, uh, you know, in many ways, a unique uh, perspective. Um, I've seen this, certainly the um, um, uh, environmental justice movement that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's exciting to hear these uh, groups of, you know, women of color and so forth saying, yes, yes, we're happy to work with Greenpeace or whoever it is, but you need to understand our community's priorities. Um, you can't just come in and impose yours. So I think that the more inclusive we become, the, you know, the more we understand, the, the richer that we are, the more approaches that we can have. But I think it's the strength and the curse of environmental movement that, it is so broad, it is so diverse. There are so many different organizations, so much stuff going on. The first couple of environmental history conferences I went to, people were at each other's throats, you know, oh, you know, you're not green enough and, you know, this is too superficial. And so it's uh, it's exciting because it is so diverse and so inclusive, um, but it's not like, okay, here's what it means uh, to be, you know, protect the environment and, and, and here's who gets to decide, um, you know, it's a uh it's sort of like my family big and loud and complex and and uh you know there's a there, there's a lot going on yeah yeah definitely i can i can imagine that you know especially those big conferences there's a lot of opinions and a lot of ideas coming together <laughs> yeah yeah and um and you know it, it's especially it's more interesting it, it will less more and less interesting now because it's it it the field has matured um, there are certain sort of, you know, basic tenants and so forth, but, uh, but still at the ground level, which is where I think the, you know, the real exciting, you know, work happens, it's still just, you know, it's, it's, it's all over the place. I'm going to be very interested uh, to find out what, uh, what you, what you find about your, uh, uh, the Village Garden Club and, and uh, what, what you're able to unearth. I, I, I'm sure it's going to be, you know, a, a great story. Yeah, well, we're excited to uh, get this underway. I know that our intern, Caitlin, is really excited to start interviewing and recording those oral history interviews. Um, she's got her questions and everything already. So we're, we're just waiting on um, victims, I guess. <laughs> uh, we're waiting on participants uh, to uh, get in contact with us and to get that started. But that should be completed by September. So we will definitely be sending that your way. <laughs> All right, so I'm curious, I, 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 are you having formal training in oral history or how are you going about this? Yes, so we have had some formal training in oral history. Hello, Caitlin, did you wanna say something or? Okay, hang on one second. All right, you should be able to unmute. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, hi, I <laughs> had a moment to, to talk, but um. I have, I do have training and I'm very excited to actually record people's stories and histories. And, you know, I can't really, I can't wait to get started on this. And this presentation was amazing and it kind of just made me more excited to start. So I really want to thank you for that too. So. Well, well I, I appreciate that. I, I, you probably don't need any advice from me, but one of the things that I learned a lot in one of the, the few oral histories that I've done is following up like a day or two later. Because then it's just like, you know, oh, well, I got them because I said, oh, no, I don't remember that or whatever. Or it was like, oh, once you, you know, once you got me thinking about that. So, I mean, I'm sure you already know this, but that, that has paid off for me in, 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 in really good ways. Okay. Thank you for the advice. I actually really appreciate that. And that will help generously. Like, so thank you. Yeah, sure. Of course. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> um, so again, we've we're really excited to be starting this project and we're really excited to be uh, going forward with this and moving forward with the Village Garden Club. It seems like the perfect inaugural year to do uh, that theme, especially as our relationship has become very close with the Village Garden Club over the past year or so. So we're excited to be starting that, especially with Caitlin as our very eager intern to get going with that. She's had a lot of training um, with humanities professionals, uh, mainly Dr. Mark Souther of Cleveland State University. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Um, 
And speaking of Dr. Mark Souther, a shameless plug, um, next week we have another virtual talk with Dr. Mark Souther. His talk is entitled City Parks and Park Suburbs, and he's going to be talking a little bit about the Garden City movement and how the Garden City movement um, impacted uh, village garden clubs, as well as, you know, the urban planning and environmental planning uh, that was shaping Shaker Heights and other garden cities around the United States. So if you're interested in that, I highly recommend that you attend. That is also a free Zoom lecture. So if anybody here is interested in that, that'll be happening next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of it for us tonight, unless anybody else has any other questions or comments to add. Again, thank you, Dr. Unger, for your time and your expertise for a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot and it was just, it was very, it was very nice to see somebody and to like put a face with the name first and foremost, but also to kind of geek out. I'm just sitting here like, oh, I'm such a huge fan. So it's, it's been a pleasure to meet you and to hear about your work and to listen to, you know, your research. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity and I very much appreciate all the good work that, uh, that you all are doing and uh, I thank you for it. Yeah, well, thank you. And thank you all for coming as well. This will be up on our YouTube channel, hopefully within the next week or so. And if you have any questions at all about this project or about anything that Dr. Unger has talked about tonight, you can email me at education at shakerhistory.org. Again, that's education at shakerhistory.org. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Dr. Unger. And I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful rest of your week. Bye-bye. <laughs>